It's Professor Sashiko Kusukawa from the University of Cambridge, and she is going to be talking on A Sincere Hand and a Faithful Eye, The Many Interests of Robert Hooke. So, Sashiko. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And first, please let me thank Jo for organising this conference so beautifully and herding me over to Oxford without fail. I'm very pleased to be here. If I may, I'd like to start with a tribute to Jim Bennett, who must be well known to this audience at Oxford. He was also much respected and fondly remembered by those of us at Cambridge, where he was the curator of the Whipple Museum of History of Science. His exhortation to historians to take seriously the practical, mathematical and mechanical traditions argued on the basis of a deep understanding of period instruments has been particularly important in appreciating somebody like Robert Hooke and certainly um, his work is the basis of my talk. Naturally, Jim was a key contributor to the resurgence of Hooke scholarship in 2003 <laughs> the tercentenary of Hooke's death. All the biographers from that occasion acknowledge Hooke's multiple interests with titles such as The Man Who Knew Too Much and London's, nay even England's, Leonardo. Michael Cooper and Michael Hunter brought together 18 scholars in their tercentenary studies to cover the interest of the man they dubbed a polymath. I'm drawing your attention to these works now as I will not be presenting his biography today, his life is far too interesting to fit into the short time I have. Since 2003, there has also been a steady stream of scholarly work on further aspects of Hooke's activities, some of which have been listed here. Again, I'm drawing your attention to these works since I won't be able to cover all of Hooke's interests, even in a cursory way. As selection is inevitable, I've chosen to discuss a few of his interests via his drawings, which are perhaps less well known and perhaps a worthy addition to his many sided talents. Oops, yeah, so here are the more recent uh, works. And many of his drawings are now at the Royal Society and are available also for free download from the Science in the Making website, launched this spring by the Royal Society. Hooke's artistic skills, as I hope to show, were critical for his scientific endeavours, encapsulated by the phrase, a sincere hand and a faithful eye, from his most famous publication, Micrographia. The phrase is related to Hooke's belief, shared by many at the time, that the human capacity for sense perception and knowledge had been corrupted because of original sin. Before the fall, Adam was capable of sharp perception and knowledge that current humans were not capable of. The brain, the imagination, memory had all become fallible as had the senses. Restoring natural philosophy thus required rectifying the limited power of human senses. This could be achieved, Hooke confidently stated, with instruments that acted as artificial organs for humans. This belief underpinned his con constant drive for instruments with finer measurements and greater accuracy. What made the hand sincere and the eye faithful for reforming natural philosophy were instruments. The be this belief in instrumental knowledge also explains Hooke's spat with the Polish astronomer Johann Hevelius whom fortunately we've already heard from Charles and uh, who had published the Selenographia. Hevelius refused to use the micrometer for telescopic observation and Hooke found this at once baffling and anathema. Hevelius claimed he did not need a micrometer because he could measure a fraction of an arc minute with his naked eye plus transversal lines marked on his instruments which he illustrated in an engraving here to your left. Hooke examined these lines with a magnifying lens and found them uneven and thus inaccurate. A product, Hooke said, of a naked eye and an unmachined hand. 
this was the opposite of a sincere hand and a faithful eye, where instruments were essential in correcting and augmenting the uh, corrupted vision and knowledge of humans. Hook was not the only person to advocate the, useful, advocate the usefulness of instrumental observation in this period. And my point today is that this hand-eye coordination was also uniquely effective in Hook because of his artistic training. As Richard Waller, Hook's friend and first biographer, noted, before Hook went up to Westminster School, he had been apprenticed to Peter Lilly, the fashionable portraitist at the time. According to Waller, Hook may not have stayed long because the oil paint gave him headaches. Hook's graphic talent and skill must have been promptly recognised by the early Royal Society, as he swiftly became the Society's de facto draftsman and was considered the most suitable person to be entrusted with the work of what became the Micrographia. Let me now first introduce some of Hook's drawings that recorded activities of the Royal Society, the Royal Society including his own instruments. I will then discuss how his graphic skills were used in his microscopical observations and the study of fossils. To the left is Hook's drawing of a bladder stone of Sir Thomas Adams, a former mayor of London. It was shown at the Society's meeting after Adams' death, and Hook was asked to draw the figure of this large stone, weighing more than 22 ounces, or 633 grams. This is unusual among Hook's surviving drawings, in that it is drawn on blue paper using red and white chalk. This was a well-known combination used by artists since the 16th century to elevate their drawings to a work of art, as in this sheet um, in the middle by Rutillo Manetti, a Sienese painter, and this particular uh, sheet was owned by Peter Lilly, who was also a collector of early drawings. In case there is any doubt about Hook's skill, here you have Hook displaying his virtuosic command of the artist's medium. And this may be the most artistically rendered bladderstone in this period. <laughs> Hook also deployed single point perspective for composition, here to show a setup of a salt mine in Hampshire, to your left. He used inkwash to model the details of a stone extracted from the heart of a dead relative of a fellow of the Royal Society. With Edward Tyson, another fellow of the Royal Society, he dissected a harbour porpoise and made the drawing in grey wash and ink. These were turned into engravings for Tyson's publication. This drawing of a bat that I found in the British Library was not for the purposes of dissection. He had, you might be able to see, here and here and here, had jotted down some measurements. And the date, May 25, 1679, falls between his comments on two designs of human flight and a flying ship suggesting that his study of the bat belonged to his long-standing interest in flight. On one occasion, Hook did not think much of the thing he was asked to draw, namely the design of a cart with legs by a rector from Somerset, Francis Potter. At the Society's meeting, Hook was asked for his comment and make a drawing of the contraption. The legends added to the pen sketch are not in the usual order of alphabets, but start with H. H is a horse. CC is a cart with legs. FFF, the feet of these legs, suggesting a hint of sarcasm. As Hook commented, the device was less convenient than a cart with wheels. <laughs> Potter was elected fellow of the Royal Society eight months later. By far, the most numerous of Hook's drawings in the Royal Society are drafts of his own instruments that accompanied his reports read at the meetings of the Royal Society. Following Jim Bennett, I've chosen three that illustrate the ways in which 
Hooke used his instruments, namely for measurements, discovery and theorization. To your left is a wheel barometer for detecting small fluctuations of the atmosphere. It shows a mercury tube with a system closed at the top and bent at the other thinner end. A float resting on the surface of the mercury on the thinner end is attached to a thread running over a pulley with a counterweight on the other end. The movement of the float is transferred via the pulley to the index on the dial to be read off. In the same spirit as the micrometer, this instrument promised precise measurement of very small values. The drawing in the middle is a time-lapse image of an instrument for discovery, namely a box to fetch water from any depth of the sea. The box drawn in red shows it, shows it with open lids as it will be lowered down. When it reaches the point of depth of the, the, the sea uh, one wishes to, then the box is pulled up but its lid will close by the pressure of the water, as it's shown by the grey box. This would enable samples of water to be collected from various depths of the sea. The device on the right is to measure the height from which a pellet should be dropped in order to nudge a weight several times its own weight. Though this does involve some precise measurements, Hooke considered this a philosophical scale, as he believed it would help him discover the relationship between the force of a falling body and its height. Hooke also used instruments to explain a theory. In this case, a rule that he had claimed priority for in what he called an anagram in 1676, and revealed two years later as ut tensio sic vis, as tension, so the power, or in longhand, the power of the spring is in proportion with the spring's tension. Hooke demonstrated this visually in the accompanying diagram, which shows weights F to N here, okay. that are in weight proportioned to each other from 1 to 8. And when any of these are placed in the scale, then the spring will stretch 8 sort of in proportion in these eight positions. This is the case with a vertical coiled spring, shown in the middle here, or horizontally coiled spring, often um, certainly used for watches, and then also for straight wire here. Hooke's image of this in instrument um, helps the reader visualize what a general rule meant of springiness meant. And these instruments in uh, that hook draws really quite, um, I think quite vividly uh, show that these drawings for him were the visual expression and confirmation of his belief in the value of instruments for natural philosophy. Hooke's graphic skills also played an important role in his microscopic observations. As a result of the king's wishes to see microscopic drawings um, of insects like the ones Christopher Wren had shown him, but Wren being too busy, Hooke was tasked to compile a book of microscopic observations for the king. For a year from December 1662 to December 1663, Hooke submitted for approval to the weekly meetings of the society microscopic drawings done by himself. Unfortunately, now, only a couple of drawings remain in the Royal Society. In the preface of Micrographia, Hooke explained how he had to observe the same object multiple times, whether a black or white spot on the object was truly a coloured spot on the surface of the object or a shadow or reflection needed to be determined by changing the direction of light, by moving a hand or a stick between the source of light and the object observed, or by checking the resolution and the shape of reflections of a window. The smooth surfaces of a steel globule marked A 
this one, and the eye of the mite on your right, the smoothness of their, uh, of their surfaces were determined by the reflection of windows. In the case of the small eyes of the horsefly, so this is the big eye, and these are the uh, what we'll call receptors, each, were, each one of them shown to look like um, a half a sphere. Here, Hook even shows his process of observation by showing here what he had actually seen. So the reflection of the two windows in Gresham College on each of these receptors, which then allows him, therefore, to argue that he had correctly deduced that the receptor, the surface of the receptor of the horse's eye was domed, a uh, half a sphere, when others before him had said that they were the other way around, they were sunken. Knowledge of how light falls on surfaces and how reflections indicate shape or texture of a surface was a fundamental part of an artistic training. This helped Hook interpret what he was seeing through a microscope. Hook's graphic skills also enabled him to move from observation to generalization on paper. This drawing from the British Library shows 16 ammonites, or snake stones, as he called them, of various shapes and sizes and states. Each fossil casts a shadow across the page, reinforcing their physical presence on the page. Each and every fossil is carefully and almost lovingly depicted and modelled in different ways, using a combination of grey and brown wash, as well as inked lines. For example, for the ammonite, labelled figure one, that looked like burnished brass, brown and grey wash was applied closely to model the general curved shape, with brown ink defining the ridges, and a small amount of area left white, and here, to indicate the brass's sheen. In contrast, the ammonite next to it, labelled figure three, Hook used predominantly grey wash with more white intervals and softer, general softer delineations to indicate that it was shiny like white brass. <coughs> Furthermore, he added transverse sections of these, co the co of these ammonites not readily observable from the way that they are laid, on, laid out on the paper. So here you see the cross sections of of the course, this is for this one, and this is this one. So it's a pretty flat um, ammonite. And here you see these cross sections too. But these are cross; uh, these, these are aspects of the three-dimensional uh, nationality of the fossil that you cannot actually capture from from these figurative um, placements um, of the ammonites. While these specimens consisted of different substances, shapes and size, Hook noted that they exhibited common features. For instance, they were made of tapering bodies that coiled up with a tip in the centre with the axis of coiling in the same plane. All of them had ridges and depressions tending towards, toward the centre of the spiral, and all of them had diaphragms whose edges were visible on the surface, or on the surface and in particular, here, he had used the micro micro microscope then to delineate in more detail these, uh, the ridges that are formed by the diaphragms. And here is another case where he has shown some of the patterns. Hook's suspicion was that these were petrified exuviae of once living beings of the sea, contrary to the predominant idea that, that these were actually concretions spontaneously formed from the salts of the earth. Hook also believed that these, these um, objects could be found in hills and mountains as now as a result of earthquakes. 
trying to demonstrate that this was the case was one of his many ongoing interests. This drawing, I think, shows that empirical observation, this drawing shows empirical observation of individual specimens, visual dissection, and discovery of details with a microscope, all recorded on one sheet of paper from which Hooke could generalize. Thanks to his artistic training, drawing became a tool for scientific observation and knowledge for Hooke. So I hope we can add drawing to his polymathic talents. But would Hooke have considered himself a polymath? We do not know. In this book by Peter Burke, Hooke is listed as number 118 of the 500 polymaths since the time of Leonardo. Polymath was a period word indicating those with general learning who mastered many, if not all, disciplines of knowledge. The first recorded use of the word polymath in an English publication, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, is in Robert Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy. And there it is suggested as an ideal for omniscience that was already difficult to attain. By the time Hook died, Book argues that the age of prodigious polymaths was over. Polymaths were more likely to be viewed with suspicion and criticised for being too distracted. This is a feature Burke calls, Burke, him, I'm not saying this, called the Leonardo syndrome. If the curse of a polymath was distraction, then Hook's friend Waller would appear to agree that Hook was one, as he wrote. It must be confessed that very many of his inventions were never brought to the perfection they were capable of, nor put in practice, till some other person, either foreigner of our own nature or of our own, own nation, cultivated the invention, which when Hook found, it put him upon the finishing that, which otherwise possibly might have lain till this time in its first defects. Whether this mistake arose from the multiplicity of his business, which did not allow him a sufficient time, or from the fertility of his invention, which hurried him on in the quest of new experiments, neglecting the former discoveries when he was once satisfied of the feasibleness and certainty of them, though they, were wanting, they, though they wanted some small matter to render the use more practical, practicable and general, I know not. Though I do not necessarily wish to push the comparison between Hooke and Leonardo, there is one intriguing historical connection that is worth noting, even if just in passing. That is, from at least 1678, when the Duke of Norfolk's library was donated to the Royal Society and was moved to Gresham College, Hooke lived and worked near a manuscript by Leonardo da Vinci, collected by the Duke's grandfather, Thomas Howard, Earl of Arundel. Now in the British Library and called Arundel 263, it is one of the most mechanical of Leonardo's manuscripts. And you can see this manuscript fully online in the British Library, but unfortunately right now I believe the British Library is, the entire system is still down. Though scholars have looked for a smoking gun, there, alas, is no direct evidence at present that Hook had read this intriguing manuscript from another polymath. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sashiko. And first of all, I would like to thank you for paying tribute to Jim Bennett. Uh, who was the curator of the uh, Museum for the History of Science, both in Oxford and in Cambridge. And I'm sure he was very much well known and very much loved by plenty of people here. So I, I was, I'm very pleased that you, paid, you made those comments on him. 
And you've certainly opened up sort of new vistas on Hook. I thought I knew quite a bit about the Hook, but I haven't seen most of those pictures before, so that was wonderful. So are there any questions? Right, well, I'll ask you a question. Oh, yes, there is a question, yes. Thank you for a fascinating talk. I'm interested if there was a link between Hook and people like Thomas Tompion, other clock makers, instrument makers in London at the same time, who were making the exquisite instruments. Uh, well, instruments, clocks, and so on. Yes, well, yes, instruments. absolutely. Um, this is covered in almost all, all the biographies of Hook. Um, that when um, so the um, when Huggins uh, wrote to the Royal Society to say that he had this invention to uh, for for a spring-driven um, watch, uh, Hook was irritated because he thought he had invented it earlier. And one of the things that he did immediately do was work with Thomas Tompion. Yeah, so th they were very close. They were close, uh, close collaborators. In fact, one of the things that, that's uh, unique about Hook is that he, he knew a, a large number of instrument makers. I mean, this was the really beautiful thing of being in London, that he was close to all these very skilled craftsmen, and Tompion certainly one of them. He also worked, um, he knew Richard Reeve, and also worked later with Christopher Cox, Cox or Cox, um, for the telescope, yeah. Gentleman here. Um, it was interesting to hear that he had what he's training, you know, in graphic works and painting and oils and everything. And he obviously did have this ability. Um, how do you see his career developing had he not had that? I mean, because obviously visualization of any concept can help and advance the idea. But um, was this really, you know, instrumental in getting his, uh, his work out there? Um, I mean, historians are not great at counterfactuals, but okay, let, let me think about this. So, um, micrographia wouldn't have happened without Hook's graphic skills. They would have probably waited for Christopher Wren or somebody else to have actually done those, uh, draw, done, done those drawings. We know that he did not engrave them. There were at least two engravers who worked on, on creating the, the, the printed image. So. Micrographia goes out of the window. Um, now, of course, Hook was not, not, great, uh, not a great sort of um, um, believer in publishing lots and lots of things. So one might say if one was thinking about um, Hook as a published author, then one might say some of the, the, um, his graphic skills um, were not that immediately useful. But still, I'd say, say it's important be because um, it's not just the drawings that he did, he actually, so it, it's a way of observing that he could see, and this has been said, for example, for Galileo, uh, for a long time since, um, uh, by art historians, in fact, that Galileo's artistic training allowed him to look through the telescope and interpret the somewhat fuzzy and partial um, vision of the surface of the moon. And, and, we have to remember that these, these instruments were not always crystal clear when um, in this period. And so to be able to deduce correctly what it is that you are looking at was something that having an artistic background would have helped. So I would say, rather than thinking about publication, if you go back to actually the whole skills involved in observation, I would say that this was quite important, certainly for Hook. A uh, person at the end of that row there in red, a red sweater. Thank you very much. The, uh, the quality of those drawings are absolutely superb. Um, you, you mentioned a little bit about the colour washes he was using, mm. but was he using any special pens or ink to achieve that kind of quality? And also when the drawings were transferred to things like micrographer where you're going to engravings, mm. did he start with a pen... Uh, sketch and then give that to somebody else who engraved or was he involved in the engraving and how do you do that transfer from from drawing to yep. engraving? Thank you. Uh, that's a, a very interesting and, and important 
oh, sorry, important question. So um, when you're drawing, there are art historians in the room, so um, I have to be uh, quite careful and, and, and liable to be corrected by them, but there's brown ink, brown ink, gray ink, and so on, and you can use, uh, you can apply that either with a brush, which gives you a kind of wash effect, or you can use a pen, like any pen or quill, cut quill, that you used for writing, which gives you a very sharp edge. Okay. Now, in these cases, there, there's, there's a lot of wash, um, sort of um, a, a brush is used, and then pens are used here to create, uh, create uh, these ridges, and certainly here, this is done by pen. Okay. Now here, I um, don't know whether it's, it's sharp enough to see that Hook has pretty much used the pen strokes to do the modelling. And you can do the modelling by stacking the lines thinner or, or more densely, and then apply cross hatches. And Hook quite often does this with some objects, just just to model something just with those lines, with a pen, because then that is easier for an engraver to follow, because engravers can only use lines, engraved lines, to make all the modelling, except with mezzotint, but that wasn't used for scientific drawing, so I, w I won't go there. But, but so, ha so if you look at the printed version of these ammonite pictures, which are in the posthumous works um, of Hook, they are they, they are they are re reproduced, and I think this was the original drawing, because and there are several drawings because the back has traces of red chalk, and what you do is you you cover the drawing the back of it in red, you put it on a copper plate, you trace it, and so you'll have the the, the lines okay, on the copper plate, which you then which the engraver then. Uh, cuts with a burin, and what that, that means, of course, that the printed version is left-right inverted. So, um, but in my humble opinion, the printed work just does not show this kind of three-dimensional um, presence that this drawing uh, shows. And um, I do recommend you, you go to the British Library and it's open again to have a look at this amazing drawing. Um, okay, the person there. Thank you. It's clear that Robert Hooke wasn't an Elon Musk type and making, intent on making a vast fortune out of his bright ideas. So how did he fund himself? Where did his money come from? Uh, thank you. So um, again, uh, most of the biographers have covered them. Um, his salary from the Royal Society was 30 pounds, I think it was at some point 40 pounds uh, a year. 10 pounds buys you a horse in, this, in 1660. So it's not much. And it is widely known that this was not his main income. The main income comes, um, in fact, in the end, for his work as surveyor of works um, after the fire of London and when he's a city surveyor and is actually saying who can, uh, and, and also helping to rebuild London. Yeah. So this is, this, is, this, this is not what, what, um, what is going to make money for Hook. Thank you. So let's have a question from over that side, the man on the end there in black. Um, so following on from that, I, I'm wondering how he was regarded for his extreme skill and uh, interest in, in practical matters. I've read Stephen Inwood's book and he was constantly going around, you know, discussing with workmen, leather workers, metal workers and so on, and he was paid to be employment secretary. Did, uh, could this uh, have led to him being uh, looked down on by gentlemen scientists or, 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 or did that British disease, uh, w w was that British disease not so apparent uh, in his time as it was later in the day? Uh, this is a really big, big topic that historians of, love, uh, of science love to debate about. Who was Robert Hooke? What was his status? Um, some, some, um, and, and indeed, 
uh, one of the, the really characteristic aspect of Hook is that he really makes use of the environment of London and being always talking with craftsmen and so on. And the bit that I actually had cut from the talk because I didn't have time is, for example, he, um, his Oxford friend John Dwight was somebody who was making white, who was trying to make white, um, uh, white stoneware. Okay. And, and he, they were talking about um, chemical compositions. And then William Sherwin, when better known for an engraver, who was actually developing ways to print on calico um, to beat the Indian imports. And Hook is talking with these people sort of every day, pretty much, um, going around London. You know, he go, goes to a society meeting and then he goes to the pub, sorry, not the pub, the coffee house, <laughs> and then he meets all these people. And so, and that kind of having that fertile exchange also is something that Hook can really take advantage of. What did what did other people think about this? Um, members of the Royal Society, other other members of the Royal Society, had a kind of um, ambivalent relationship with him because they needed Hook for the daily business of the society to run because they were far too busy and doing other things. And, and on the other hand, there were people like Boyle who were very aloof and gentlemen, um, but who would acknowledge the fact that Hook built him the air pump, after all, which was an incredibly difficult <laughs> machine to, uh, to maintain. So, um, I guess my short answer to that is it depends on who, you know, who you are in the period. But, um, but certainly um, some people may have looked down on his connections with, with traders and um, entrepreneurs as they saw it. So there's the man there on the end with the... Could you say a little more about his rather unusual training and education? I think you mentioned that he was apprenticed um, uh, before he went to Westminster. Yeah. Um, was that unusual? Um, uh, and how, well, how, how long did he spend? How old was he when he went to Westminster? And how long did he spend as, an, as a painter's apprentice? We don't know how long he spent with Peter Lilly. Um, maybe not that long. So, and I presume he went up to, I can't remember exactly which age he, he went up to Westminster to, 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 but I presume normal age. And from Westminster Minster, Minster he went to Oxford. Yeah, but I believe it may have been slightly unusual. I think in parts, some of the biogra biographies, it says that the folks' father thought that because he was so good with the hands and could already draw, that he'd better off being apprentice to a skilled skilled master in London rather than go, having an education. I think his father died before he went to Westminster, so that was part of the problem. He didn't have any money because his father right. had died. Right, okay. Yeah. Uh, the person in orange. Thank you, it's very interesting. Uh, two comments. One is that in the transaction to the Royal Society, there are a number of hook inventions of drawing machines, not camera obscuras, yep. but perspectographs. Yes. Yep. And one of them is specifically for drawing specimens. Yep. I'm not sure that's been adequately, adequately worked out. There may be a very good article on it somewhere. Mm. The second is that Hook is spectacularly smart and he realises that convincing people they're looking at something real rather than an invented thing, an artefact of the system, he drew these parallels that the pollen grains become like lemons in a bowl. Is it the, the uh, flea has got a bodkin, yeah. so he's got these visual references to tie them in and make these implausible looking things familiar in terms of everyday descriptions, which, yeah. is, which is very smart. Yes, thank you. Right, uh, um, any, any further questions? Yes, right in the front row, Andrew. Thank you. 
I may have missed it, but did Hook actually refer to himself as a polymath? I wasn't quite clear. Not, not to my knowledge. Cheers. Thanks for a fascinating guided tour through that. I didn't quite catch what you were saying about that flying animal. Was it a flying bat? Could I see the picture again, please? And what was going on with the inspiration there? So there was some flying animal that he was inspired by. Yeah, ah, one, right. Yeah. Thank you. He calls it an Indian bat. We don't know whether it comes from the West or the East Indies because there are fruit bats on, on, in either areas. Um, yeah. And unfortunately, the, the wing bit is, is broken off, so you don't see the entire span of the paper. So what I think he did was he had a piece of paper and he put the bat prone on it and traced its outlines and then measured the, the spans of the wing. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, can you say anything about um, Hooke's relationship with Newton, that other great polymath of the period, and whether Hooke's sup vastly superior drawing skills compared to Newton caused a friction between them? Right. Um, actually, it's interesting. Newton can draw, I found out. And, um, and in fact, there's a fascinating notebook by Newton in Cambridge University Library where he actually, um, I, I've shown you the, the frozen urine and, and, the, and the snowflakes earlier, where Newton, in fact, copies those images when he's taking notes. And, and he, can, he can draw. Um, yes, so uh, definitely, but um, just uh, perhaps it's just worth quickly mentioning, because I was half expecting somebody to ask me about him and Newton. <laughs> Let me just... Right, OK, so... No, no, they don't. So um, one of the things that... And, and I'm drawing on a physicist's work, um, Naumberg, here. But one of the th things that Hooke said was, 1674, all celestial bodies whatsoever have an attraction or a gravitating power towards their own centres, whereby they attract not only their own parts and keep away from flying from them, as we may have observed the Earth to do, but that they also attract all the other celestial bodies which are within the sphere of their activities. And this is considered to be the f first published suggestion that the gravitation force which attracts objects to the surface of the Earth also attacks on attracts, um, acts between celestial bodies. There's also the letter, the famous letter, uh, from Hook to Newton, where he says, a hook explains that his supposition is that the attraction always is in duplicate, this is about planets, duplicate proportion to the distance from the centre reciprocal. So it's an inverse square law that Hook suggests to Newton, after which Newton changes his mind about the universe being filled with ether and starts working on gravity. Um, but um, the best I would refer you to uh, these works, oh, uh, um, there's something else going on here too, but uh, the best work on this material uh, I'd suggest is Michael Naumberg's Robert Hooke's Seminal Contribution to Orbital Dynamics, but also um, Guicciardi, Nicola Guicciardini, who is uh, a specialist in Newton, has quite a lot to say about their different approaches on uh, about the theory of gravitation. So um, I, I have nothing new to add to this, so I refer you to these two very important works. Thank you very much. So are there any further questions? No, I don't think so. So, Sashiko, thank you very, very much indeed for a fabulous talk and showing us wonderful pictures. <laughs>